Hey everybody, welcome. I am excited to be here today with my new friend, David Nekritman. Did I say that right? Yeah, you can say Nekritman or Nekritman. Nekritman or Nekritman. Just call me Brother David, that's fine. Well, there we go, David. <laughs> I'll just call you the feed. <laughs> okay. There we go. <laughs> so it's so good to be here with you guys. We're going to be talking about something that is really important to all of us. And I think that is a crucial um, lack in our society today. And it's actually, um, it's robbing us from a huge blessing uh, from not actually, you know, do it. So as we get, I got, we got seven people here already. Hey guys, say hi. As we get more into it, we want to get, we want to answer your questions as well. So make sure that you guys are putting your questions and your comments down. I'm really excited about this opportunity. David, thank you so much for being here today. Well, blessings from uh, Zion, as we say, from Israel. It's well, an honor I'm to be with you today. I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, this this is um, truly being a blessing to be able to get this interview together. Um, I'm really, um, hi Taylor. I am really excited about what you're doing. Uh, I got your book here, your Shabbat invitation. I actually got two copies. One copy actually is with my rabbi right now. <laughs> Okay, good. I drop it up in his house. He's going through it. He's like, this is really good. God is really using David. And my rabbi's name is actually David too. So he's like, yes. So that is a huge blessing. I'm loving going through this. And I'm so excited about the course. I know we're going to be talking about that in a while. Hi, Cece. Hi, Taylor. Hi, Cassie. It's good to have you guys here. So David, tell us a little bit about you. Hi, Don. So um, I served the calling of Jewish Christian relations for 22 years, first for the Israeli Council in New York as director of Christian affairs from 2000 to 2005. And I decided to Israel in July of 2005 to be a chapter heading in sacred history uh, and make a prophecy in fulfillment as the ingathering of the exiles to Israel for the Jewish people to come back home. Uh, it's great to have a wife who was born in Israel. Uh, her, her parents came over from Operation Eagle's Wings when her grandmother and mother trekked through the desert from Yemen and then was airlifted to Israel. And then um, I spent two years in uh, high tech and in sales. And then Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, who was the former chief rabbi of Afrat, heard about me and asked me to open up the first Orthodox Jewish center to actively dialogue and cooperate with Christians. And that was for the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation. So we were the first Orthodox Jewish institution in the entire world on what we call the yeshiva campus, on a Jewish parochial campus where we export the second largest rabbis in the world. Uh, and then I served that in that position as executive director for the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation for 14 years. And then since September of 2021, stepped out of that role because a Christian grandmothers and mothers asking me, how can we elevate a Christian Bible homeschool education for high schoolers to really understand how you can fuse critical thinking and Hebraic understanding? And so therefore, in a few weeks from now, uh, we launch that first type of model uh, for the homeschool Christian world. So that's so exciting. I, just to let your listeners know, I am the first Orthodox Jew to ever graduate from a spirit-filled graduate the theological degree program. So I graduated from Oral Roberts University. And uh, Dr. Brad Young was my thesis advisor, and my thesis is on the Hebraic roots of the Holy Spirit. So that is claim. so amazing. Can I read your thesis? Because I would love to read your thesis. Sure. I wrote it specifically on Esther and the Holy Spirit. That uh, is amazing. Yeah, because uh, here you have, a, first of all, you know, in less than two weeks, we go, we're going to celebrate the book of Esther. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's coming. A, yeah, that book is taking place outside of Israel when the Jewish nation is in exile. Uh, we don't have God's name in the book, but yet uh, we believe that it was not only was it written by the Holy Spirit, but Esther was canonized in Hebrew scriptures by the Holy Spirit and the holiday itself. As we know in Esther chapter 9, verses 27 through 28, was created by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are scriptural references that Esther would eventually come from the, you know, from the five books of Moses, namely in, in Deuteronomy chapter, 
Yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 31. But the mere fact that this is like a this is a Holy Spirit on steroids uh, season right now that we are in. And the Amazing. book of Esther really shows that. So that Amazing. was my thesis. That's so exciting. Well, my daughter's name is Hadassah. Hadassah uh -huh. Lia. Yeah, she was a Purim baby born in Jerusalem. So we know a lot about the book of Esther. <laughs> the real name of Esther before it's she became Hadassah. Esther was Hadassah gave her the name Adasa. Yes, yeah, she's Hadas Halia, and then I have the youngest one. It's, her name is Ariella Haleo, and she's a little lioness of God, and uh, God has blessed me so much. But um, I come also from a Jewish background, and but I became a believer in Yeshua and moved to Israel and went to Bible college in Israel. Well, I first did theology here for five years. And my ministry, it's a lot like yours, because for 12 years, I taught the churches all over the United States and Brazil and other countries. I taught them about everything about the Jewish culture and about the biblical feast and about the Sabbath. And it has been just a blessing to see churches coming to the Hebraic understanding of script, scriptures. It, it's truly eye-opening. And many of the moms that I see here, actually, I'm a Torah student because I teach Torah every Wednesday morning. So it's um, I teach Torah club with First Fruit of Zions. And, and it's just a blessing to see the church coming to this understanding where we came from, right? Right. I've always said, like, Jesus uh, was Jewish, but I think for Christians... They have to think if if Jesus is Jewish, and um, and I want Christians to be Christ centered. I want them to understand that although they believe in the hundred percent divinity of Jesus, he also is a hundred percent human, and his humanity was born in a Jewish home. Therefore, he grew up within the Judaisms of his day. Uh, we could see through through the Gospels that he lived a Jewish lifestyle. He did, um, and therefore. Maybe by re-examining, we can help to elevate uh, Christian homeschool education because I think what Jesus, you see in the, in the stories, especially in the infancy stories of Jesus, where he's escaping from his parents one day when they made pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the holiday, he's found at the temple and he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the sages at the temple. And But what's happening is a question and answer uh, uh, sort of dialogue that's going back and forth. So one of the things you learn in a Hebraic world is the art of the question. And that's what we're giving over in biblical excavations and specifically uh, with what we're doing in your Sabbath invitation. Yeah, that's right. And uh, if you guys are not familiar with us Jews, like we always answer a question with another question. <laughs> That's how it goes. And Yeshua knew that well. And it's pretty neat because even if you think about it, so my son had his, his uh, bar mitzvah last year. My daughter had this year. And I have another one at the end of the year, uh, her bar mitzvah coming up in December. And uh, if you look at what happened to Yeshua when he was left at the temple, he ended up staying there talking to the rabbis. He was, it was the preparation for his bar mitzvah, right? So he is... He's just like, he has so much knowledge and, and understanding downloaded from Abba Father alone and the Holy Spirit. And he's there and he's just so hungry for uh, the word of God from Torah. And he's discussing those things in such a high level. And for him, and he says, I'm in my father's heart, my father's house, right? He's taking care of his father's business. And he's just so excited about that. And I look at it fast and I'm like, I want my kids to be the same way. I want them to be so hungry for the word of God. I want them to delight in talking about the word of God and, and to, to delight about uh, talking about God. And it does require a lot of critical thinking because we, unfortunately, we live in a world that where um, Christianity is very sugar-coated, very su sugar-coated, and, and everything is so watered down. And I, and I, I really like, um, I, I fear that most young Christians don't know the word as they're supposed to. Well, we know the Barnard's statistics quite well that yes. you only have, you know, 16% of Christians actually engaged in their Bible every day. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then you probably have less than 50% actually engaging once a week. So here you're in a world that you have access to any type of Bible you want 
literally through your phone. And yet it seems like we have a generation that's most illiterate of the it Bible. Is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so G- Generation Z is considered a Bible, Bible illiterated. And not only that, um, the statistics tells us that about 70 to 80 percent of all Christian kids that go to public school will end up actually living their faith by the time that they get to high school and college because they don't have that daily engagement with the word of God the way that they're supposed to have. So my, my husband and I, we worked as pastors for many, many years. We're Messianic ministers. We work in a Messianic synagogue. We minister there uh, um, every Shabbat. Um, and we we see the difference between the homeschoolers who are studying the word of God at home every single day. And, you know, I mean, in the teenage years and the ones who are not the difference right there, they're so, um, you know, the ones who are not in the word of God all the time, first of all, they, they got no understanding and it's really hard for them to just wrap their heads around because they're not being taught well. Right. And they're this they're so distant from that reality so when I saw your course, I was really excited about, I was really excited because first of all, um, when I came to Yeshua, I fell in love with the word of God and I, I grew up without it. Very secular, you know, you, you live a mile from the synagogue and you got all your Jewish friends and your boyfriends and stuff. And yet God was nowhere in my family. Um, the word of God was in no, nowhere in my family. Thank God by age 26, God did a huge miracle in my life, healed me from a cancer. That's how I came to him. And from that moment on, I started reading scriptures and I couldn't put it down. I was just so hungry. The more like I read, the more I wanted to. And, and at the beginning, I didn't have anybody to teach me. Right. So now I see what a blessing there are. Kids got to be taught um, and, and they have the opportunity to learn so much more than I did. And, and, and to be so much more passionate even for the word of God and the kingdom of God. Yeah. But, but again, at the same time, we're looking at the different uh, Bible curriculums that are out there. And it does seem that there's an emphasis on a devotional approach to scripture. And yes. what, we're tr- what we're trying to do is actually fuse the critical thinking and Hebraic understanding. Because I think it's one of the keys, even for homeschool children, I don't want them to walk away with, I have to do this because my parents are asking me, I want, I want the child to be really excited to excavate revelational nuggets from scripture and actually have that frame of mind that learning is like an excavation. It's we actually, what we try to do in, in, uh, in the uh, curriculum is you're like on a tour bus, but sometimes you just have to get off the bus and get your hands dirty in order to really appreciate what you're about to find out. So yeah, so this is the this is the uh, mission is just to elevate how homeschool Bible education is delivered today. That is so exciting to hear, David. So excited. So today we actually um, we're here to talk about rest. We're here to talk about Shabbat. Why Shabbat? Um, I think that is so important. And I know that Gina and I we were talking about some questions here that we had that we wanted to talk to homeschool uh, moms about it. We want to talk about Shabbat, the Shabbat mindset. Um, practicing rest in our homeschool, the purpose of rest in your homeschool. And I wanted to share something because one of the things that I do also in my homeschool, not only that, but in ministry as well. I don't know if you guys can see it. And I share this as well with my community, with my membership program, is that every seventh um, Shabbat, we actually take the week off. That's what we do too as well. So that was the way that we we found to incorporate Shabbat in our homeschool. So we do six weeks homeschool. One week we kind of take off, we relax, you know. And my husband does the same thing. Um, he's our cantor at the synagogue, so he he leads the liturgy and the worship like six Shabbat, and that which is actually this Shabbat is our Shabbat off. So we're excited. We're gonna be resting. But um, yeah, that's something that I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's kind of like shaded a little bit strong. It's hard to see. It. I, it's hard to see, but I got the shade concept over there. So yes. you're doing you're doing sort of a sabbatical cycle every six weeks. Yes. So so that in and, and that is so good. So good. And I can share this with you guys later on. Just message me on Facebook. I can share a template with you guys if you want to start in, implementing this into your uh, your rhythm, your homeschool rhythm as well. All right, David, 
let's uh, talk about the first question. What is the Shabbat mindset? The Shabbat mindset really is uh, a, a plug in. I would, the way I would uh, address this in a, in a macro sense is it's a hundred watt a light bulb as opposed to a 60 watt light bulb. You're actually plugging in. I think many people have a misconception on Shabbat that it's a, a list of do's and don'ts. Uh, for children, it could be excruciating that what am I supposed to be doing on this day? And I think it's an opportunity to actually plug in more. Um, yeah. In Israel, we have a 220 plug. In the United States, you we have a 110 plug. <laughs> right. So Shabbat is really a 220. If, if this is not a vacation day, uh, if you want to take a vacation, take a vacation. Uh, if you want a me day, then do a me day. But this is what I believe is a capital H-I-M day. This is a him day. And therefore, the way we operate on the Sabbath has to be sort of different than the way we operate during the weekday. We know this because if you look at the pattern that you have in Genesis 1 and the unfolding of creation, you have a uh, the number one pattern standing out is it was evening, it was morning, and just just insert the day. And then when you get to the seventh day, Genesis chapter two, verses one through three, guess what's missing? The pattern. So here's a here's a Hebraic nugget. Like you're looking in like, why is the pattern missing? Sometimes what's missing is more important than what's written. And therefore, the question is, is why is the pattern? What the, what is the pattern for the first six days? And why isn't the pattern appearing? And what can we take away from it? And here comes the Sabbath mindset. God for the first six days was making order out of chaos. We know that the opening of the first day was quite chaotic. It says so. Uh, and, the, and slowly but surely each day you're taking chaos into order. And we know by the end of the sixth day, everything was completed. That means everything was ordered. So what did God create on the seventh day? And he created a day, a day that would be a tabernacle in time where he's inviting you into his amplified transparent presence that's right so so this this what we call rest is not so much that i'm sleeping all day or i'm not doing any activity it's a question of what type of activity are we doing for god that will help us reflect on what we did for him the past week and what we wish to do for him in the week coming forward that's right um, if we don't have that that sabbath then we tend to usually think we're gods uh, and therefore, God is put into the rhythm of the calendar, the rhythm of the week that, no, 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 you're a human being. You're here in my hopes that you will actualize kingdom in the world. So take a moment out and soak in my amplified presence and then reflect of what you did and where we want to go. So I, I want to take out the notion this is not about do's and don'ts. I really want people to plug in. What is the type of conversation that we're actually we're actually talking at the table on the Sabbath. What type of lessons, Bible lessons and messages are we talking about? What is the big idea that we can go ahead and speak at the Sabbath table? Because part of this is not disengaging with the community. It's actually engaging with the community. Mm -hmm. And I would even say this. I think most people don't realize a lot of the miracles that Jesus did actually took place on the Sabbath. He even healed someone's mother-in-law, Simon Peter's mother-in-law on the Sabbath. The, the, a lot of the miracles are happening in the synagogue, but what's happening on the, what, which day is the synagogue service taking place that Jesus is doing the miracle? It's on the Sabbath. So there's like Sabbath healing. So what are we doing to heal people, heal relationships? So the framework of, of looking at the Sabbath should be from the mindset of plugging in. It's not sort of an unplug uh, MTV uh, episode. This is really much what can I, God, how am I reflecting on his kingdom? What do I need to work on myself? And how are we engaging with the community with Sabbath mindset principles? That's right. That's really good. And I think that's really important that you mentioned that when we are not taking that Sabbath off, um, we're, we're just trying to be God. And, and God, the creator, he said that, the, you know, he created Shabbat for men, not men for Shabbat, right? He, as a creator, he knows that we cannot just keep going, going, going. We need to plug into him who is the source of all things. We need to be restored and refreshed and recharged in him so we can actually be a witness for him. 
during the other six days of the week. Right. So we could be a good witness to our children. Um, I think that is so important, David, because we're living in a society that is 24 seven going, 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 going. And our kids are falling in our footsteps and our kids are being the same way. And there is no breaks. There's no rest to restore their bodies, to restore their minds. And it's something that really bothers me. Um, and we we've we've done some radical things in our house to kind of uh uh, it's not, it's not, um, how do you call it, uh, to repair the damage, but it's, it's really to just to bring it a good, uh, rhythm into our family. So we don't have TVs in the house anymore. We do have computers and we do use computers for, for homeschool and stuff, but we don't have TVs in the house anymore on, on Shabbat. Well, first we're, we are a synagogue in the morning, but when we come home, we play games or we go to the beach or we do other things. We're in fellowship with other families, right? Like we're, we're doing other things too. It's not like we're sitting in the house doing nothing or we're laying down and doing nothing, but we're also, we're having those great conversations. We are reading the Bible. We're talking about, you know, the message or whatever happened in synagogue that morning. And guess what? We still go to church on Sundays. A lot of Sundays we go to church. So a lot of people ask me like, Oh, if I keep Shabbat, like, um, don't I have, I mean, like, do I stop going to church? I'm like, no, I mean, you can worship God any day. It's a church, not- yeah, so, yeah, I agree with you. A church service is not Sabbath. A church service is a church service. Sabbath means it's an, it's a recognition that God put out an invitation to the world. And I want to make this very clear. This is not a post Sinai Sabbath that I talk about in the book. There is a pre-Sinai Sabbath and there's a redemptive Sabbath that Isaiah 66, 23 talks about that all of humanity be worshiping the eternal. And this is Isaiah 66, 23. So therefore, I want to talk about actually fulfilling or do in fulfillment together with Christians without asking them to do uh, an Orthodox Jewish practice of Sabbath. Uh, Jews have a tabernacle paradigm of Sabbath because after the the construction of the tabernacle uh, with Bezalel, uh, we have the Sabbath uh, mandate repeated. And in Jewish in- interpretive analysis of scripture, we have something called episodic connections. And mm-hmm. why is one particular episode following another episode? So therefore, when Sabbath follows the end of the, of the complete con- uh, construction of the tabernacle, we believe that how we view work is through whatever was through the tabernacle, tabernacle, whatever was made, uh, whatever was offered. So, but that's not what I'm asking n- uh, non-Jews. And again, Christians who believe in Abraham, uh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not asking you to eat kefilte fish. I'm not asking you <laughs> to go ahead and uh, not turn on the electric on the Sabbath. And I, what I'm saying is that before Sinai, already built in the DNA of the world was this concept. And we already know from Exodus chapter 16 that a nation rested on the Sabbath that incorporated both the biological descendants of Jacob as well as the great mixed multitude that came out with the Jewish people in Exodus chapter 12, verse 38. So when I look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 30, the way I I make the translation is the nation Shabbated on the seventh day. But the thing is, is it's it's quite weird to even think of that because that means if Moses is telling them tomorrow is going to be the Sabbath, if I was someone in the crowd, I would just say, hey, Moses, hey, hi, what's the Sabbath? Because at the time, uh, the Jewish people were saturated in Egyptian paganism, and the Egyptians had a ten-day calendar. Yes, a ten a ten-day week. On, yeah, so that means week. a yeah. week had ten days. Uh, the biblical understanding of a week is seven days. Uh, we have other uh, civilizations that either put thirteen days, or eight days, or six days, but seven days is pretty much divine, uh, and it is it quite much of a Holy Spirit move. To have the world on a seven day week, it but is. it took, it took time to get there. So if I was the person saying, Hey Moses in Exodus chapter 16, you're talking about Sabbath. I wish that Sabbath. So it means it was already understood that there was a Sabbath in the world, that the idea was already there, uh, how it looked and what people were doing. We don't know, but 
uh, things changed after the tabernacle and we associated work with that for the Jewish people, for the Jewish people alone, and not for non-Jews who are believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So yeah. I just want to, I want to clarify what yeah. we're talking about on that, on that Sabbath. And there's a redemptive Sabbath. That means I would even say to Jewish people, we tend to do Sabbath out of a remembrance of what was. That means we were taken out from Egypt, uh, God the greater, God the redeemer, a past events. But I'm looking towards the future as Isaiah was looking towards the future. And that therefore uh, Sabbath has to have a redemptive component to it. So I think this is crucial in when we're reflecting on Sabbath and reflecting on our week, what are we doing to help redemption move forward under kingdom principles? Yes, that is really good because Shabbat is a prophetic picture of the Olam Haba, the, the world to come, right? So for us Christians, the millennium, this is this is a prophetic picture of the millennium, of the rest that we're going to have. And it's really exciting because, well, uh, scripture says that from one new moon to another, from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord, right? That's exactly what it says. So we know that even in the millennium, everyone is going to come to celebrate Shabbat at some point. Um, that is, that's really, I mean, there's so much that we can talk about it. And I know we can twist some minds if people have no basic understanding of Shabbat. They're like, what are they talking about? But anyways, I wanted to talk about, you talk about the Shabbat, um, Shabbat mindset. And I think we should talk a little bit about the purpose of rest in homeschooling and then how to practice that rest in homeschool. Uh, so the way I, I would look at rest in the homeschool world is, again, it's not a vacation day. It's not about sleeping all day. It's a way to recalibrate your day that doesn't look like a weekday. So what is it that we're doing, let's say, for a meal on the Sabbath, right? Are we preparing the best cuisine? Is the family getting together? to make that work. Like, like I always say when you're, when it's almost like when you're greeting a family member at the airport, right? There's so. if you haven't seen that family member for such a long time, what are you trying? What will you do? Normally you would clean the house up. You would get the best meal that your family member wants when they get home. You're actually going to a store, buying flowers or buying some type of gifts. And there's this anticipation that happens every single time people are coming out from the customs area into the arrivals area. How are we developing that each week for our own family that they do get excited by this? Therefore, the family needs to be involved in the cooking and the cleaning because you're coming to welcome the king in your home. That's right. And in a very different way that you would do during the week. So if you had an important individual coming to your home, you would make sure you had the best laid out for that. Uh, and therefore, the conversation would be different, right? What, what messages are we going to be, be preparing during the week that will help give a revelational nugget to people to improve their relationship with God? So not so much of homework with science and math, but more on spiritual matters and then more engaging with the family. And you want to teach this to your child because the regiment is very important because when they grow up, you want them to carry covenant out with their families. But we want to make this fun because the things I've heard over the years for people, even for people who thought Sunday was Sabbath, which I don't think is the notion anymore. I think anyone, I'm 49, but I understood from my oh, Christian We're friends. We're the same age. <laughs> so my Christian friends often, you would say to me, Sunday is my Sabbath. But if I speak to someone 30 and younger, no one's thinking Sunday is Sabbath. It's yeah. almost as we're scheduling God in to whatever day we're doing. Whatever, whatever we are doing. Yeah. As, as opposed to what is it that we can do to serve the community, the way to we can serve the family and how are we getting together more often in the family on a spiritual level besides just doing, okay, I have this football practice or this dance practice, and you're rushing from one, one chore to the next chore. We got to get the science homework done. We got to get the math homework done uh, and whatever other subjects that you're involved in. Therefore, I would think that when it comes to the Sabbath, it should be really structured completely around the Bible and the big questions that we need to discuss at the table. Yeah, and and I love that you mentioned too, like um, 
for example, um, on Shabbat, right? So we lived in Israel for many years too, and we obviously we do Kabbalah Shabbat. We welcome the Sabbath, and for us, it's always that picture of welcoming the King that you mentioned, right? So it's like our family is leaving the mundane activities and starting into a time where we're setting apart for for Him and for rest and for each other, and you know, and it's it's so exciting. So. Shabbat afternoon, Friday afternoon, my girls, like we're talking about, let's go get challah or let's bake our challah. Let's, you know, clean the house. Let's make the table. So in our family, we have our own rhythms and rhythms and traditions, right? Because that's how my kids have kept Shabbat their entire lives. That's all they know, right? They, they don't know how not to, but we have many friends who have never done. And we also have friends who do as well. But it's just neat to see that it's embedded in their rhythm. It's part of, like, it's something that they look forward to. If you ask my kids what's their favorite day of the week, they're going to say it's a Sabbath. Why? Because it's all about us being together as a family. It's all about us resting. It's all about, like, having fun together. It's about us doing the, you know, like the prayers and we worship, you know, and, and this is kind of something that I, I talk a lot about it. Um, I think we need to rescue the family worship time, the family gathering to pray together. And that used to be in Christianity. As far as I hear stories, that used to be a common practice that families will gather together once a week or or in the evenings and they will read the bible together and they will pray together as well and and it's not something that we see very often today so yeah. whatever whatever you know like there's there's no specific format like david was saying like well, nobody's talking about you have to follow this and do this you know it's not about this and don'ts but it's about you say what can i do with my family to set that day apart, that it's yeah. something that's going to be, you know, focus and, and, and bringing God the glory, but it's going to be a blessing to our family, right? What Correct. can you come up with? And each family is different and their Shabbats are going to look very different. But uh, what we, we did, but we did put in some recommendations. Yes, so for I people just to, just to, as a platform to think about uh, first uh, we, we bless our wives. I think this is very important. We, I'm a, I'm a Frank Sinatra, Michael Bublé. Every Friday <laughs> evening, when I, when I serenade my wife with Proverbs chapter 31, usually translated as a woman of valor. Yeah. Uh, in the it's book, I actually funny. talk about that's not the correct translation. In Hebrew, it's called Eshet Chayil. Yeah. And, and usually, that uh, Hebrew word Chayil means something like a GI Jane concept or a woman of wealth of influence, uh, but the person who actually received that title, the only biblical character that received that title was Ruth. And we know, we know Ruth wasn't G.I. Jane, and we know that Ruth wasn't of influence because she was gathering up the leftovers in the field. So I discuss in the book that there was a transformation happening uh, in chapter three in the book of Ruth where Boaz receives a Holy Spirit moment, knowing full well this woman has left completely her Moabite ways and now will be uh, incorporated into the Jewish nation, which is really uh, revolutionary because we know that there is a Bible verse that no Moabite or Ammonite will be coming into the nation of Israel because they didn't give hospitality to the Jewish people in the desert. And yet here's this woman who not only goes in, but she be, because of what she did, she is the great grandmother of redemption because David comes she out is. from her. Yeah, so she what, was the great grandmother of David, King David. Right. So what you're what you're seeing in Gen, what you're seeing and in Ruth, she's in the lineage of Yeshua. Correct. So you see that uh, that Ruth has a transformation that's happening because of what she did for her mother Naomi that she was willing to go ahead and nourish her. She was willing to go out and not have her name carried, but carry the name of Naomi by going ahead and doing this Levite style marriage with Boaz. She didn't have to do it, but she did. She wanted to carry the name of Naomi. And because of that, she was rewarded. And the way she was rewarded, she was given this title. So what we're saying to our wives is that they're, they are the essence and part of the redempt, redemption that moves things forward.
by me is the I can't be who I am without my wife. Uh, remember, in Genesis, it tells me that I'm supposed to leave my parents and become one with my wife. It's the husbands that have to realize the importance of women and women in redemption. You, you can see that in the beginning of Exodus, that everything is happening because of women. Moses wouldn't be who he was without women. Uh, so there's an important redemptive role. And therefore, we're saying to we're our spouse. We're the giver of life, right? Not only a giver of life, but they're, they're the primary movers and shakers in redemption. And therefore, we are acknowledging that as husbands to our wives. And then we follow that by blessing our children. And I think I've had Christian pastors, prominent pastors at my table for Shabbat. Uh, in Israel. And when I, when I begin to bless my kids, these pastors begin to cry. And I'm like, why are you crying? And he said, I never received a blessing from my own father or my own mother. That's right. Bad. So, so to engage that, that the parents are engaging and blessing the kids. And uh, I, we do the blessing, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh, because I have three boys. Uh, one is 22, one is 19 and one is 15. Um, but People have added, may you be also like Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel, Rachel, Leah, right? These are the matriarchs. You know, the yeah. matriarchs couldn't be who they were without the matriarchs. So we, we take this custom that was developed late in Jewish history, and we, we, we go ahead and we provide this custom at the table, and then we begin the meal. And the meal for me is two and a half hours minimum with my kids because we're engaging on the big questions. Now that they're older, because they're... My youngest is high school age, but my but everyone is then challenging whatever is happening outside with the questions at the table. But it's over a meal. It doesn't feel like oh, we are 45 minutes. We're going to teach you a lesson from a PowerPoint. It's very much part of the osmosis of living covenant. It's organic. At the table. Yeah. It's very much organic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a delight, right? Shabbat, it's supposed to be called a delight. And it is a delight. And and sometimes we can stay in the Shabbat table for many hours, especially if you got people over. You, like it's a very common thing to actually have people over for Shabbat meal, which is it's a blessing, not just for us to close ourselves in our own shell, but also to open the doors and invite others to partake of that cool. Shabbat meal together, to break bread together. Um, how do you come up with the questions each week? Cassie's asking. Oh, so it's good. it depends on how uh, how you in the book. There are going to be texts that we point out. This is sort of the springboard that you can use at a Shabbat table to actually reflect over these texts. And then what we do, uh, as far as our custom is concerned, uh, we have a set reading from the Pentateuch, from the five books of Moses. Well, Cassie is my Torah student. She, we do the parasha together every week. Right. Yeah. So uh, again, I, I'm not sure where, where, yeah. they educate, where, how much Hebraic roots people have within your audience. So I just want to use the English words. Yes, I, we call it parasha tashavua. We call it a selection of texts from, from uh, each week to do an annual cycle of completing the five books of Moses. But uh, even a Christian denomination and mainline Christian denominations, they have set scriptural readings that they're going to do on Sunday. You can already prepare that already on the Shabbat table. So you shouldn't be like surprised at what the pastor is saying on Sunday. Uh, mm -hmm. You should come with your game, you know, best game, your game A, right face right there ready uh, because you already study the scripture beforehand. This is the opportunity to take what set scripture that you have, either from a denominational or non-denominational point of view, but even say, Explore Proverbs chapter 31 because it's Solomon praying tribute to his great grandmother, Ruth. Okay, so let's go into those verses. Let's go into Genesis chapter uh, 48 where we have we have uh, Jacob going ahead and making this blessing. Let's let's uh, delve into Psalm 92, which the psalm is dedicated to a Sabbath day. Most people miss that because they don't have verse one there. It actually looks like a title. And then verse one is actually, it's great to give thanks to really, uh, it starts with a psalm, a song to the Sabbath day, or we say in Hebrew, Mizmor Shir, Leom HaShabbat. We're going ahead and giving this melody combined with lyrics, uh, honor to the Sabbath. And it's weird. Why would you have a psalm dedicated to the day? Usually we have characters. We have mm -hmm. David, we have Asaf. 
Um, we have Korah. We have all these people, yet we have one a day as a character. Explore that. A psalm is about the Sabbath, but doesn't talk about the Sabbath. Right? So we give those texts as a starting point to already begin to engage on the Sabbath on a whole new level. And for us, we inaugurate the Sabbath through Psalms 95 to 99. And these were these are our uh, Welcome the King Psalms. So why these Psalms? Why do we, we, we recite those? So these are just starting points, but you can begin to understand, like, look at Sabbath even in the Gospels from a Christian point of view. Look at why, point out all the miracles that happen on the Sabbath, why these miracles are happening, why is Sabbath healing important? So here's a few suggestions I'm just giving you right now in three minutes, but could take you at least a year or two years to explore it. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much. You guys, even if you just get together and read the Gospels on, on Shabbat evening and, and have discussions about it, but there's so many great scriptures. If you uh, if you are reading the parasha, by the way, I do have um, I'm going to I'm going to try to upload to your share with you guys on Facebook. I have a Torah reading tracker that you guys uh, can print it out and follow along and read it along. And we read through the Torah. We read through the prophets and we read through the Brit Hadasha as well, the New Testament as well, every every week and we have great discussions wednesdays wednesday mornings are like our favorite mornings to study uh torah together it's really good but just hey start where you are start where you are um we don't have a lot of time because i'm going to teach a class um in 18 minutes but how can we uh create a sabbath rhythm like we talked about that um not not just for homeschool, but also for work and in general in life. Okay, so we begin with already uh, on Sunday. First thing you should be declaring is this is the first day going to Sabbath. What the declaration that I'm already thinking about Sabbath every single day. This is the second day towards the Sabbath. Uh, I would say when you go grocery shopping, uh, already try to pick out your best food. And like, imagine you come to the cashier's uh, place and um, cashier's counter and you say, and you're really smiling. And the cashier is saying, why are you smiling? Because I designated these food for Sabbath. I'm a Sabbath shopper, but that's happening on Monday. That's happening on Tuesday. You find something that's really good that you want to bring to the table for the Sabbath, a good goodie for the kids and something like that. But the anticipation already begins that. Then you already say, hey, what day in the week should I start planning to begin my Sabbath messages? So all of this is how you're going to develop your Sabbath anticipation, not necessarily a rhythm, but the anticipation of it and anticipation in actions and set aside those times saying, this is my time to prepare for Sabbath. But I, I wish, and the same thing with cooking yeah. the meal as itself, like, this should be a family event. And I, I'm like, every single act that you do, dicing the salad, uh, putting the pasta in the water, making this the bread. Is making the bread. You like to make bread. I like to buy the bread. That's fine. <laughs> but but I did, like I make Moroccan fish. That's my, my expertise. But I'm, what I'm saying is that when you're making it, we're saying in the household, whoa, uh, I'm doing this in anticipation for Sabbath. So I want to be a Sabbath shopper. I want to be, I want to go ahead and prepare my messages. I'm declaring each day and looking forward to the Sabbath. And so these are sort of small recommendations. And as you're developing that preparation and that anticipation, more things will come to you through the yeah. Holy Spirit. And do involve the children. Let them take everything. Over. Everything is about the family. Yeah. You can't, we can't outsource faith to a call center. That's right. Faith, that's Faith a has good to be in. one. And you know what, David? The saddest thing that I see in Christianity today, it's parents who are outsourcing Bible teaching and everything else. They, you know, they just trust that one hour Sunday school is going to do the job that they're supposed to do every day for their children. And it's kind of sad, right? Um, and yes, Cassie, we have book club with the kids now coming up. But I, I wanted to really encourage you guys because um, your book, it's really fascinating. I've learned a ton. 
Um, Cass is also one of my Hebrew students. There's some of it. Uh, Don is one of my Hebrew students here as well. And some more of you guys here. Um, you're going to learn also a lot of great Hebrew words and you're going to understand Hebrew text. I mean, this is so good, um, not only for yourself, but for your high schooler as well. Um, I looked at the curriculum and I was like, Gina, this is for the whole family. I know this is like geared for the high schoolers, but this is for the whole family. Mom and dad needs to learn this alongside them because this is really, really great. Yeah, I, I, I love, love that. So I'll just add one thing with the high school curriculum on this book. We rewrote it for a high school level. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, we added 4K video, what we call biblical excavations on location. So the revelational nuggets that are in the chapters and the book, the textbook study guide, we're actually on location talking about that nugget. So because not everyone can just process through reading, uh, they also need the visual. So sort of yeah. a, we prepare them with these revelational nuggets. We go to Capernaum, we go to Tel Megiddo, we go to the Temple Mount. Uh, so we're all over and it's the only curriculum that I know of that actually is taking Israel, the geographic location, and bringing it to the student. Uh, because that, that's how much I value uh, children learning the Bible, obviously the family engaging, uh, because Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, really says why Abraham was elected by God, because he knew that he will teach covenant to the next generation. So the highest, highest um, title that you can have from a biblical paradigm is educator. And therefore, I really value uh, homeschool families and parents really taking out the time to give the best to their children with the best uh, Judeo-Christian values embedded in this. I know that the public school education in the last few years has been, been a real challenge to people who are Christian, who are Jewish, who send their kids to there, learning stuff that's counter uh, intuitive to what we we uh, who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are supposed to be doing. Um, we're so saturated in a me generation that I think homeschool parents understand the value that this is not about me. This is about him. And this is how we're going to unfold education and the proper values to our children. So for me to serve in this capacity uh, at 49 and I think the first 22 years of my life prepared me for this moment. But thank God for people like Gina and, and Noble and Tamara Poole and a whole network of, of Christian mothers and grandmothers that came to me and helped me and guide me and to do what we're doing that what, right now with biblicalexcavations.com. So and let me tell you, you're going to have a whole new set of fans now from the homeschool sisterhood because those are moms who listen. We put teaching the Bible and apologetics and critical thinking uh, as the core of everything that we do. Like that's the priority of everything that we do. And this mom's like they are on fire for the Lord, but they want their kids to be on fire for the Lord as well. And I've been actually talking to them about your curriculum and I am excited to get started now in March with my kids. And I know that a lot of them are going to jump on board and join us as well. And so we we just want to learn more and we want, we want our kids to learn more. So I'm excited. Thank you so much, David, for spending this time with us. I want to do I want to continue this conversation. Sure. I want to do a second interview. So uh, let's try. Let's try to book. Oh, maybe. shout out to Lisa Nearing. Just want to yes, let you know. Lisa, Lisa Nearing just came on. I want Lisa and I go back at least 10 years. So I just want to say thank you to Lisa and her husband, David, uh, for their friendship over the years. Amazing. Lisa is awesome. And I love Lisa and I love Gina. They're awesome. I'm so glad that Gina connected with me about this project. I'm totally on board. I mean, this is something that I'm so behind, uh, behind you and just trying to support the work that you're doing because I know it's life changing. This is going to change a lot of lives and a lot of families. And it's, God's going to be honored in, in so many ways. So we're going to do an encore, right? Let me we're know. Doing an encore? Okay, oh, we're, we're doing an encore. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do another one, maybe in a week or two. Uh, I know you're going to be traveling next week to Scotland. Yeah, so you're gonna be it's gonna be gonna be in Scotland. And um, meeting some homeschool networks there as well as in England. That's 
awesome. Yeah. So let's try to do that. But maybe next time we're going to do it on Zoom and we're going to open for questions and answers. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Thank you for this amazing so opportunity. That... <laughs> Shabbat shalom. Tomorrow Shabbat night. Shalom. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. And please place your, your, your questions in the comments because David and I are going to come back here. We're going to circle back and we're going to try to answer your questions and connect with you guys. Thank you so much.